pushed uh, a keynote really signifying a rising star in the area. And we're very proud and happy to have Dorsa uh, give the keynote today. Uh, I've known Dorsa since she was a graduate student at Berkeley uh, and followed her then and have followed her since. Uh, she's now a professor at Stanford and has been since 2017. Uh, and she works at this intersection of learning and control and robotics that's incredibly interesting, uh, incredibly high visibility, um, but more than anything, incredibly hard. Uh, when you talk about putting humans in the middle of cyber physical systems, and then you do some control theory on top of that, and then put learning into the mix, it, it raises interesting and unique challenges. Uh, and that's why it's so exciting, I think, for the HSCC community as a whole because it really has to draw on all our strengths to address. So we look forward to, and I look forward to getting inspiration from this talk and seeing the future directions in this domain. So with that, I will hand it to Dorsa without further ado, or without further uh, ado. But one quick note before we start logistically, I ask people to refrain from questions during the presentation itself. If you have a question, you can send me a chat or the group a chat, uh, and I will ask her the question if it's really pressing, but otherwise I wanna wait till questions at the end. At the end, we're gonna try to take live questions, meaning you can unmute yourself and ask a question. That's fine, but wait till the end, please, to avoid disruptions. So with that, I'm gonna hand it to Dorsa. Right, thank you, and thanks for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm really excited to be here, uh, be in my home office, but talk to you guys um, about human CPS. So let me just get this shirt. Okay, so everyone sees the screen. Thumbs up, Erin. Looks good? Yep, great. Okay. Looks great. Perfect. You're set. All right, sounds good. So yeah, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dorsa, and I know we were supposed to wake up in the morning in Australia, Sydney, and unfortunately, we are not there, and I'm also sad. Uh, but I'm in my home office from Palo Alto, so it's not looking that bad. One heads up is today is the garbage truck day, so you might hear three trucks coming through during this talk. Just a heads up on that. Uh, but yeah, so it's not looking that bad, but I'm hoping everyone's staying safe and healthy, and I'm really looking forward to catching up with everyone after this whole thing is over. So today what I'd like to do is I would like to talk about the problems and challenges that exist in the field of human cyber-physical systems and specifically human-robot interaction. And I would like to look at these problems from the lens of learning and control and what are some challenges and what are some opportunities that exist from the field of learning and control to address some of these problems. So if you think about robotics in the past decade, robotics in the past decade has made a lot of advances. And, and a lot of these advances is due to the theory and foundations that are actually developed in control and learning. So here you see on the left, you see the Boston Dynamics robot doing parkour, which is like amazing. Every time I look at these videos, like uh, it blows my mind. And that's like due to really like good controllers that they have here, like getting the robot do these interesting, interesting tasks. And then on the right, you see the open AI uh, hands doing dexterous manipulation, moving from one block to another block, which is again, like really interesting using ideas from reinforcement learning and control in general, doing these types of amazing tasks. So the advances that we have seen is both in theory, but also in practice, we're seeing really cool like results and really like challenging robotics domains. But the type of problems that I'm interested in tries to even like go beyond this a little bit and consider settings that we are interacting with agents that are somewhat intelligent, but somewhat, somewhat rational, but not exactly rational. And, and these are basically humans. So, so if you think about interactions with humans, you might like the first thing that you might think is human human interaction. So, so humans are really good at this actually. They come into each other's spaces and they collaborate and coordinate with each other and, and really complex manipulation tasks. And another thing that they're really good at is they tend to take actions that influence each other. So, so they trick each other or they do things that's good for themselves or for the team. And ideally what we would like to do is we would like to do the same thing, right? Like we would like to bring in robots to human spaces to collaborate and coordinate with them, anticipate what humans are going to do next and kind of respond in real time and work well with them. And that's actually pretty challenging. So, um, so in this talk, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get across three main points. The first point is that I do think there is an opportunity here for us. There's an opportunity for using ideas from learning and control. 
and specifically for formalizing some of these problems. Some of these problems are not even like formalized. So, so how do we formalize human robot interaction? And how do we go about addressing, solving some of these challenging problems that exist when we have interactions between multiple agents, specifically if some or one of those agents is humans? And then what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend a little bit of talk in the talk discussing how we go about building computational models of human behavior. So, so on surface, you might think that, well, this should be the job of cognitive scientists or psychologists, but I would actually like, like to argue that we have the right tools to do that. Like, like using, again, learning and control, like those are the right tools when it comes to building these computational models. So I would like to discuss like, where the state of the art is and what we have done in order to build these models. And then at some point, I would like to step back a little bit and think about like, when these models are actually necessary. Because, because if you think about it, in a lot of settings, humans themselves are not keeping track of high, compu high, high dimensional computational models of each other. Like humans tend to keep track of much lower dimensional things, like sometimes low dimensional statistics that is actually enough to capture high dimensional interaction. So I would like to spend a little bit of time discussing what these low dimensional statistics look like. I'm gonna call them conventions and I'll come back to that later in the talk. And then finally, I would like to wrap up with, with another idea that we have been working towards more recently, thinking about the fact that, well, we model humans, we model conventions, but, but humans are not constant agents. They actually change all the time. So, so half the time they don't even know what they want and then they, they change their preferences or they change the way they do things. And, and how can we go about learning and controlling when we are in a setting where we have non-stationary models of humans, like when humans are not these stationary agents that are not necessarily changing? So I would like to kind of wrap up with that thought. So, so those are kind of the three points that I would like to discuss in this talk. And when I talk about interaction, I thought it would be good to show you guys at the beginning a few settings of interactions that we are thinking about in the lab, because it's not as obvious when we talk about human-robot interaction. What do, I, what do we actually mean by that? So the first setup that I will be talking about, and that's something that is pretty common in human-robot interaction and human CPS in general, is you have the human agent, and the human is, is a teacher, is, is an agent that knows everything. So, so in this case, the human knows how the robot should do a thing. Let's say play a version of mini golf and get the ball inside of one of those balls. So like the blue ball there, all right? So, so let's say human has that preference, knows that. And, and the idea is, can the robot learn from the human? Can the, can the human teach the robot through various sources of data that it can, it can provide, maybe demonstrations or maybe pairwise comparisons or feedback or even language? Could we use these different sources of data in order to teach robots how they should do tasks or what humans really want? So that's one paradigm of interaction. Another paradigm of interaction that I do think is pretty interesting and maybe like understudied a little bit is, is an assistive teleoperation paradigm. So this is a paradigm where, again, the robot is doing the task. Let's say the robot in this case is picking up these marshmallows and bringing them back to the person. And then what the human is doing is the human is putting in an input into the robot using a joystick. But the thing is, it's actually not obvious what input you should put in into the joystick. It might not even have the same dimensions as your robot. Your robot is high dimensional. You might be using a controller that only has like a few dimensions. And then in the video, it kind of looked like pretty smooth, but, but that's actually using our algorithm. I will show you guys how this is not like that obvious to, to do teleoperation. And then in this case, again, the robot needs to understand and build a convention with the human and try to figure out what the human really wants in this setup. And finally, the last setup um, that I guess like, a, like is more common is a dyadic interaction setting where you have the human and robot coordinating and collaborating with each other in a more symmetric way. Like both of them are intelligent agents, they're coming in together and they're collaborating and co coordinating on various tasks. So here on the left, what I'm showing is, is a discrete type of action. So a sequential decision-making setup. Where, where the human and robot are building a tower together. So they're moving the blocks and building a tower together. And then on the right, the difference here is on the right, the actions are going to be in a continuous space. So, so what the robot, uh, so, so what you can consider is collaboratively transporting objects with robots. So you're putting in forces. And the only thing that the robot is feeling is the forces, which is in the continuous space. 
And a lot of these ideas that, that we are developing when we think about human-robot interaction actually goes beyond human-robot interaction and like, can be applicable in multi-robot settings in decentralized control, as you can see on the right, actually. Like the two robots together are trying to move an object. So this is just kind of like a brief overview of settings and robots that, that we work with, with in the lab. But, but my plan for today is I'm going to spend the first part of the talk discussing human models. So specifically, I would like to talk about how we learn reward functions as a, as a computational model that represents what humans want and how we use ideas from active learning and, and how do we do this in a data efficient way where we can use different sources of data to learn these reward functions. And then what I'd like to do is I would like to talk about settings that are not as normal. So like, what if, what if you're in risky scenarios? What if you're in the end of the risk spectrum? How do these reward functions change? Or could we use the same things? Or should we change something? So if you're in safety critical type settings. So I'd like to discuss a little bit of the, uh, human modeling like and perspectives around human modeling in that setup. And then towards the end of the talk, I would like to switch gears and discuss interaction a little bit more carefully and, and think about low dimensional representations that can capture conventions that get built between, between agents and, and what those conventions mean and how that can help us in interactive settings. So, so that's the plan for today. All right. Okay, so let, let me just get into it. So, so let's talk about human modeling and why do we even need that? So imagine, imagine you have a robot and let's say your robot wants to pick up an object. It wants to pick up the, the cup here, the green cup here, okay? So if you wanna do that task, what you can do is you can write down a reward function, let's say R, that reward function is a function of trajectories, psi, or you can write a, an objective or, or specification, a temporal logic specification, and then your robot should be able to go and do the task the way you told it, because you gave it the specification, right? The robot should synthesize a controller that does the job. But the thing is, writing, this, writing the reward function or writing specifications is actually not very obvious. So I feel like everyone in their own field has seen this. Like if you're doing formal methods, you know writing specifications is hard. If you're doing robotics, you know writing reward functions is hard. If you're doing control, you know writing objective is, is actually pretty challenging. And then there's a whole field around this actually in the past decade around this idea of reward design. How do we design reward functions? And, and why is it difficult? So, so let me give you um, kind of like a fun example of why it is difficult to write reward functions. This is actually one of those canonical examples that's used in this field. So, so imagine you have a vacuum cleaner, okay? And then you have, you have a robot vacuum cleaner that's supposed to clean dirt. That's, that's what it's supposed to do, okay? So, so you can write the objective and the objective is suck up as much dirt as possible. Okay? So, so that is my objective. And what the robots, the robot vacuum cleaner can do is it can go and suck up this dirt and then it, it's happy. And what you'd expect the robot to do is to go and pick up like all these other dirts that are there. But another way of satisfying this specification of I'm gonna suck up as much dirt as possible is that for the robot to put out the dirt again and suck it up again and put it out again. And, and, and like it can keep doing that, right? Like the same, the same, it can stay in the same location and kind of like keep doing the same thing. Another thing it can do is it can actually kill its sensors so it doesn't see the dirt. So, so that's like another possible thing that it could do. And then I know this is kind of like a made up example, but the same sort of thing actually happens when you're thinking about designing these reward functions. Usually people have a hard time writing them because they tend to like miss things that, that the robot can, can take. And this particular phenomenon is called reward hacking, where the robot is, is figuring out the reward function and hacking it and ends up doing this behavior that you weren't expecting. And that comes up like constantly when you're thinking about robotics applications. Like you write a reward function, it does a weird thing. And I'm like, no, that's not what I meant. I meant this other thing. So, so it's actually pretty challenging to write reward functions. So what the field has been thinking actually for the past like 20 years now is, is that maybe writing this reward function is not the right way of going about this. Like the right way of going about this is that the human has some objective in their mind, some reward function in their mind. I'm gonna call that RH, so reward function of the human. And what the robot should do is it should try to come up with an estimate of that, like its best guess of what the human really wants. And one way of doing that is if the human can demonstrate how a robot should do a task, like pick up objects, then from those demonstrations, the robot should try to figure out what the reward function is. Okay, so this is commonly known as learning from demonstrations or, or imitation learning, right? Like you would imitate what the, how the human would do this. 
And then there's like established like area of research around that. So, so we thought, okay, that's a cool idea. Let's try to do that on our robot. So we brought in our robot and here our robot, what it wants to do is it wants to reach the goal. So the goal is this black pad here. And at the same time, it wants to avoid the obstacle. So the, the box here, the blue box here and keep its arm low. So what we decided to do was we decided to collect some expert demonstrations and just do learning from demonstrations for, from that and try to learn this reward function, okay? So we brought in an expert. This is Andy, my graduate student. And what Andy is doing is he's using the keyword and he's, he's controlling the end effector of the robot. So he's doing end effector control, getting the end effector to move, and then the robot is computing what the other joints need to do. And then it's trying to bring the end effector to the black pad. So one thing to notice here is even Andy, who has a lot of experience with this robot, is having a hard time like getting this robot to do the right thing. So, so, so we were kind of worried about that, but we thought, okay, that's okay. Let's, let's just collect some data, see how it looks like. This is our expert. This is how it's gonna look like. So, so once you collect that data, so, so you collect some expert data, and from that, you have probability of actions of humans. So that's what comes up on this side of the equation. And then what we used was we used this idea called inverse reinforcement learning or inverse optimal control. And what it does is it basically tries to capture what that reward function actually is, like that the human is trying to, trying to optimize. Okay? So, so based on the trajectories you collect, you get probability of actions of humans. The assumption is that this probability is proportional to exponential of a reward function. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to solve for that reward function. And commonly, like this reward function is modeled as a linear reward function in terms of a set of nonlinear features that are, that are hand-coded by design. So, so the thing that you want to learn at the end of the day are the parameters, these Ws, the weights of each one of these features. So that's the thing that you'd want to learn. And, and once you do that, then you have a reward function. You're happy. You can optimize that reward function and you get a policy. You can go to a new scenario and optimize that reward function and hope it will work. So, so we decided to do that, right? We decided to generate a new scenario. The new scenario, the box is on the other side. We have the Pringles box and the robot is supposed to reach actually the top of the Pringles box. Okay. All right. So, so this is actually what comes out of that reward function that is learned from demonstrations. So the robot kind of starts off okay. And at some point it sees the obstacle and it's like, oh my God, there's an obstacle there. So then it tries to just like stay away from the obstacle as much as possible. And it ends up in this like weird configuration that like never reaches the Pringles box. So, so what is really happening here is that the robot is overfitting to Andy's trajectories and it thinks obstacle avoidance is so bad that it tries to stay away from the obstacle as much as it possible. And it doesn't even realize that, hey, there is a goal that I should try to get to. And that wasn't that great. Like, like if this is like the results that you're going to get, then it means that demonstrations are not like easy things to deal with. And, and maybe we should be looking at something else. So, so at this point we thought, okay, maybe it is Andy. Maybe, maybe Andy is just not good at this task. Maybe we should get other people. So, so what we decided to do was we decided to get like a variety of users like, and then collect data from them and see like what type of behavior we see. And, and we actually ended up seeing the same sort of weird behavior on the robot. And actually here are some of the things that our users said. Like one of them said, I found the system difficult as someone who is not kinetically gifted. Well, I'm not personally kinetically gifted. If that is the case, then, then we can't re really rely on demonstrations. Like demonstrations alone, they're, they're noisy and they're not gonna really capture what the human really wants. And we should look at other sources of data. This also like introduces this other problem that the fact that teleoperation is hard. So I'm gonna come back to that later in the talk discussing like, what we can do around teleoperation. But, but the other point is, yeah, demonstrations alone is not going to give us information. So our key idea here is that we should leverage different sources of data in order to learn these reward functions. Demonstrations is only one source and it can only give us like so much. But in addition to demonstrations, we should look at other sources of data, maybe language instructions or even like physical feedback. Like if you physically push the arm towards a different direction, like that physical feedback has a lot of information in it or even comparisons, like pairwise comparisons between trajectories. I think that has a lot of interesting information in it. So currently in our work, we are looking at these different sources of data, but in this talk, 
I would like to talk a little bit about comparisons, pairwise comparisons, and how we use that to learn reward functions and how we combine that with demonstrations in order to better learn these reward functions. So what do I mean by, by comparison? So what I mean by comparisons is what the robot can do is it can be like, okay, I don't want your demonstration. Let me just generate two trajectories. I'll just myself generate two trajectories, psi A and psi B. And then I'll just ask you, well, which one do you prefer? What do you want? Do you like A or do you like B? And based on the human's response, like if the person says, well, I like B over A, that gives us some information about this underlying reward function. That tells us reward of trajectory B is higher than reward of trajectory A. And, and again, this reward function could be a linear combination of set of features. And that tells us something about these W's, the parameters of the features. So, so that was based on one single binary question. But the interesting, interesting question that we have here is actually, if I ask this question and based on your response, I get some information, what should be the next and most informative question that I can ask? In general, what is a sequence of queries, sequence of questions that I should be asking you in order to basically learn this reward function fairly quickly? What is the most informative, diverse set of questions that I can ask a human in order to figure out what the reward function should be? And again, like, I would like to remind you that we are in a limited data regime. So like, we cannot like, get millions of millions of data from this person. So we should be really careful like, what we are asking from the person. Right? Like, like, and, and here, um, like a lot of times people say, well, I have this robot, and the robot is trained on this much amount of data. But the amount of data is not really the thing that matters. The thing that matters is the, quali the quality of data. Like, How does that data look like? What information is it giving us? And is it actually informative, given that I already have so much data about other things. So, so that's basically what we're trying to do here. And that's the idea around active learning. And in this case, in, um, in, in this work, we are looking at active preference-based learning, where we are actively generating these questions, these queries, in order to learn the reward function. So at every step, the optimization that we're running is something that is of this form. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out these fees that correspond to that scenario, those two trajectories that I'll be generating. So, so I'm, I'm trying to find those two trajectories that maximize the amount of information that I would get from it. And the information here is formalized by this idea of well, how much volume would be removed from my hypothesis space. So I have a hypothesis space for the reward functions. And based on that question that I'm asking, I would like to remove as much volume as possible from that hypothesis space. So, so that's what this equation is trying to capture based on the human's response. If the human tells me they like A over B or B over A, in either case, I would like to be very informative. We also use this human noise model here. Like we don't really like trust like the, every, every response we get from humans because humans can be noisy. So if they tell me they like A over B, what we do is we inject some noise here so we don't completely assume that B is horrible and we should just take A, like we actually use a noisy model of the human. And in addition to all of these, we need to have, we need to have a constraint. And the constraint is ensuring that these trajectories we are generating are actually feasible and they can run on a robot and, and satisfy the dynamics of that robot and all those extra things that need to be satisfied. But basically, this is the optimization that is run at every point in time. And then the robot generates two trajectories, asks the person, what do you think? And, and, and then gets response from the person. All right, so, so that was basically the, the kind of core idea of, of pairwise preferences. Um, I haven't talked about all the details, but I just want to give you a general like, idea of what it means for the robot to generate pairwise preferences, or even rankings. You can think about rankings too, and, and actively query the person and, and get information from the person. So, um, so, so the thing about preferences is that like, they're pretty nice, right? They're pr pretty easy to get. And then they're very accurate. So, so the other interesting thing is if the person tells me, well, I don't like that robot to hit an obstacle, but I can really trust that answer. So, so they're pretty accurate. They're very easy. But the problem with them is they only give us one bit of information. And that one bit of information is just if A is better than B or B is better than A. So, so that's only like the only information I'm getting from preferences. On the other hand, like we've been talking about demonstrations for a little bit. So, so demonstrations, they're pretty rich and informative. If you remember Andy providing those demonstrations, like you can see the style, you can see the timing, you can see actually a lot of information in demonstrations. 
But the problem with them is that they tend to be noisy and they tend to be inaccurate. Like, like Andy wasn't even able to like reach the pad. So, uh, so they have their own issues here. And an idea that we have been thinking about in the lab in general in the past couple of years is how can we combine these different sources of data in an efficient way, in the, in the most like optimal way, so we can, we can learn these reward functions in, a, in, a, in an efficient manner. So in this case, let's say if I only have access to preferences and demonstration and a fixed number of them, how should I combine these preferences and demonstrations in order to better learn a reward function? And actually the optimal way of combining them is to start off with demonstrations, right? Because they're rich and informative, right? Uh, so what I can do is with, with that richness and informativeness, I can warm start my algorithm with demonstrations and quickly like figure out what is generally the hypothesis space that I should be looking at. So have some estimate of the reward function. But once I have that, what I can do is I can generate new preference queries and I can query the person, well, now you gave me this demonstration, but how about these other trajectories that I've just created, T1 and T2, what do you think about those? And then basically ask these, these compare, pairwise comparisons or rankings from the person and based on their response, keep going through this loop in order to fine tune the reward function. Because again, preferences, they, they're pretty accurate, so they do help me in terms of like fine tuning the reward function. So, so that's one way for combining these two different sources of data. And, and based on combining them, here's actually some results to look at. This is the work at RSS uh, this past year. And uh, what you can see is on the left, this is the result that you saw already. So this is ju just from demonstrations. And then on the right, you see the result of combining demonstrations and preferences. It kind of starts off a little more challenging, but at the end, it does reach the goal. And, and the goal is actually like on top, of the, on top of the Pringles box. So we're not doing any grasping. This is a reaching task. So it's just trying to reach the Pringles, uh, Pringles box. And the thing that, again, I want to emphasize here is this is with very limited amount of data. This is like with like five demonstrations and like 10 per vice comparison queries. So, so with very like limited amount of data, the robot is able to like do this task and learn this more general reward function that can be used in a variety of scenarios, which, which is kind of exciting. And, and the other reason that I do think like using ideas from active learning and being efficient is actually really important in this field is if you think about learning and, and machine learning in general and the type of the type of impact that it has made to different fields, like it has made a huge impact in fields like natural language processing or vision. In robotics, we haven't seen the same, like the same type of impact yet. And part of it is just like getting data is so hard when you're dealing with humans or when you're dealing with robots. So I do think we should be more efficient in collecting our data. And we should try to use all these different sources of data that we can get our hands on and combine them in an efficient way in order to better understand and learn reward functions. So, so that's kind of the key idea of, of this project. We've considered like other settings and other considerations that I'm not discussing in this talk. So for example, we've considered settings where the reward function actually changes over time. So we have a non-stationary reward function and it dynamically changes over time. We have considered settings where we have non-linear reward functions. So everything I've talked about so far assumes this linear form of the reward function W times C. But what if we are like beyond that and, and, and we are considering a non-linear setting? And, and finally, we've considered settings where, in addition to thinking about what is good for the robot, we consider what's good for the human too. So like you can generate the most informative question that you think is good for the robot, but that most informative question could be really difficult for the person to, to respond to and might be really like indistinguishable. The trajectories might be really hard to distinguish between. So what we consider is like what is easy for the person to respond to as well as what is informative for the robot and, and this other coral work that I didn't discuss. All right, so that was kind of the first idea. We are in a normal scenario, we wanna have limited data, we wanna learn reward functions. And reward functions is this computational model that I've been using to talk about uh, computational models of humans, robot trying to understand what humans want. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to switch gears a little bit and now talk about when we are in risky scenarios. Does the same reward function work or like should we consider other, other, set, other uh, modeling paradigms? So, so let me, uh, so I think we kind of like all agree, if you want to have a robot interacting with humans, that robots should have some computational representation of what the human wants or how the human acts. And, and we see that in robotics, we see that in autonomous driving. 
But if you consider settings where humans are interacting with robots in safety critical settings, for example, a human on a factory floor um, interacting with these giant robots, like, like that's a pretty dangerous scenario, or thinking about um, autonomous cars interacting with humans in near accident scenarios. A question to ask is how do, how do models of humans change in these settings and how should robots respond in these settings? Like what changes? So let me motivate this by, by an example. So, so imagine we have an autonomous car. That's the red car down the road and the red car down the road wants to come in and make an unprotected left turn, okay? And then I have a blue car right here too and the blue car is just going straight. So that's all it's doing. And what's going to happen is that the light is going to turn yellow at some point. So when the light turns yellow, then the question is, what would the blue car do? So, so an optimal blue car should stop, the, right, and the light is going to turn red really quickly, so it should actually stop. So, so if the autonomous car, if the, blue, uh, if the red car thinks that the, the, the blue car is going to actually stop, it will decide to make, it a, um, it's, uh, make the unprotected left turn, and if it turns out that the blue car didn't stop, then we end up in this particular like accident scenario. And actually, I think we all have seen cars passing yellow lights or red lights. So it's not like incredibly uncommon for that to happen. Like, like that actually does happen in some scenarios. And, and if the robot doesn't actually capture that, then, then it would end up in these accident scenarios. So the idea that we have been exploring is robots should actually recognize that, that people are not always optimal, right? They actually act suboptimally, specifically when we are in risky scenarios. And how are we going to, uh, to, to model that, I think is an interesting question. So, so far, everything I've said is about learning this reward function that captures the human model. And I would expect the human to be a maximizer of this reward function and take the optimal action. Okay, so, so far I've been assuming that I have these rational, optimal humans that just take the optimal action, maximize the reward function, and then everything will be great. So actually the field, like in the past few years, have been thinking about the fact that, well, this is not like an absolutely correct model. Maybe we shouldn't do this. Like humans are not deterministic. They're not going to deterministically take, take the optimal action. And the most common model that has been used in the field now is this noisily rational model. So what the noisily rational model does is it basically says, okay, humans are not going to be deterministic, they're probabilistic, and the probability of their actions is going to be proportional to exponential of some theta parameter times reward function. And this theta parameter is commonly known as a rationality coefficient. It's a temperature parameter. And if you put theta equal to infinity, what will happen is that the noisily rational model just becomes equal to the optimal action, and then if you put theta equal to zero, then you get random action, like human action ends up being random. And if you pick theta anything in between, then you have this distribution that kind of represents how humans are going to act. So this is a better model than the rational optimal action, but the problem with this model is it still assumes that the most likely action of the human is the optimal action. And, and that's not always the case. Like if you remember the scenario that we just saw, the, the, the unprotected left turn example, Actually, it turns out that the most likely action of the human could be something that is suboptimal. Like maybe like all humans end up accelerating and running the yellow light. We should be able to capture that. The fact that the most likely action of uh, humans in some scenarios is not the optimal action. So ideally, I would like to be able to capture a model that corresponds to the orange line here. And the noisily rational model doesn't really capture that. So what we have been thinking about is could we use ideas from behavioral economics, specifically prospect theory, in order to get this risk error model. So the way we do that is we say, well, probability of actions of humans is still going to be proportional to exponential of some theta times some reward function. But what we are going to do is we are going to transform this reward function. This is not going to be our old reward function. What we're going to do is we're going to transform it in order to capture this risk error representation of how humans act. So if you remember, our old reward function is going to be some of, some of these different outcomes of probability of an action times the reward of an action. And what we are going to do is we are going to make these nonlinear transformations both on the reward function and on the probability in order to capture uh, risk. So let's look at them one by one. So, so let's pick reward. So if the dotted line here is the true reward uh, of, of the human, um, what we are doing is we are making this nonlinear transformation on top of the true reward. This is our risk of our model. 
And what this model captures is if you're in the high risk scenario, high reward scenario, in the high reward scenario, people have a harder time differentiating between like dif different values. But in low reward scenario, people have an easier time differentiating that. So, so that's actually like the same sort of phenomena that shows up when you look at humans trying to differentiate between $1 million and $1 million and 10K. 10K loses its value because you're, you're in a high reward setting and you have a smaller slope there. But if you're in a setting where you're kind of comparing $1 and 10K, like, like 10K actually has a lot of value there. So, so you have this larger slope representing that people have an easier time distinguishing between that. So, so if you're making this nonlinear transformation on the reward function that's captured by a few hyperparameters, alpha, beta, and lambda, and these could be fit to the data that we collect in these different scenarios based, based on the user study data that we get from humans. Okay. All right, so that was the reward function. Similarly, we can make nonlinear transformations on the probability. So, so imagine that again, we have the true probability being the dotted line. The nonlinear um, representation now in the risk of error model is going to be the orange line here. And what the orange line is doing is, is that it's overweighing low probability events and underweighing high probability events. And, and that, is, uh, that can be represented again by, non, by this nonlinear transformation. And gamma here again is a hyperparameter that we can fit. And again, this is a similar phenomenon as buying insurance or, or buying lottery tickets, because you consider these low probability events, they're pretty low probability in reality, but people tend to overweigh them. And because of that, they tend to take these like somewhat suboptimal actions. And, and actually people make money off of that, right? That's why like insurance works actually, right? So, so using the sim a similar idea, we can make these nonlinear transformations on probability and reward. And then we're gonna get this risk of our model of the reward. So we decided to look at this in the driving example and, and see like what the true model is and if we can actually capture that using these nonlinear transformations. So, so we decided to look at the unprotected left turn example. And then we did a study. In this study, we collected uh, data in terms of how people make decisions here. We varied a few factors like information and time, but the only thing that actually made a difference was the risk value. So we can consider a high risk scenario where the light turns red 95% of the time, or you can consider low risk scenarios where the light turns red only 5% of the times. So in the high risk scenario, the majority of people ended up stopping. That's actually the optimal action, so that's fine. In the low risk scenario, it turns out that the majority of people still decide to stop taking this suboptimal action. So when you're in the low risk scenario in this case, it turns out that people tend to are more likely to take a suboptimal action. And this is the result of the study, but we are interested in seeing if our model is able to capture that. So if, again, you use this, this risk of error model, the risk of error model and noisily rational model, both of them are capable in doing the same sort of prediction uh, using in the high risk scenario. So their prediction and the true value that's coming from the study ends up being the same thing. But actually the low risk scenario is a scenario where the risk of our model is having an easier time capturing that because it actually considers the fact that humans don't need to be optimal. They could be, like their most likely action could be this suboptimal thing. And, and this type of behavior, this type of risk of remodeling and planning is not just about driving. It actually like goes beyond driving. So, so we decided to look at it in a, in a robotic scenario. So, so we decided to design an experiment in a robotic scenario where the robot actually plans based on the models that it learns. So, so here, the scenario is a cup stacking setting where we have these cups and we are putting the cups on top of each other and building a tower. The cups are located at different locations. So there's different like, levels of efficiency in terms of picking them up. And at the same time, there are different sizes. So, so you can put them in, on top of each other like with different orders. So you have two options. You have an option of building an efficient but unstable tower, kind of like the Tower of Pisa. And, and if you do that, then the tower stays upright only 20% of the times. But you are going to get a very high reward. So you're going to get 105 points if the tower stays up. So that's one option, efficient but unstable tower. The other option is building a tower that's actually very inefficient, but, but it is stable. Like if you put it upright, it's going to always stay upright. It never falls. But if you build this tower, you're only going to get 20 points because, because that's the inefficient tower. Okay? If you consider these two scenarios, actually the optimal thing is to take risk, to go and build the efficient but unstable tower, because that will have like higher reward. You, you should like go and build that. 
So if you have a robot that assumes that human is noisily rational, that robot assumes that human is going to take risk. So it assumes that human is going to go and pick up the purple cup. Because of that, the robot will go and pick up the orange cup in order to do the complementary thing. But it turns out that humans in these scenarios are overly concerned about the tower falling. So they actually end up doing the suboptimal thing and they end up going for the efficient tower. So because of that, both the robot and the human go for the same cup. The robot needs to replan and go and pick up something else and bring that back up. And it will take longer to do the task together. Here's actually seeing it in action. So, so Roberto is picking up the cup. Robot is going for the same cup. It comes up empty handed and it needs to go and pick up something else and then build a tower. But if you're using our model, if you're using our risk of rare model, what happens is that the robot actually predicts correctly that the human is going to be overly concerned about picking up this object. And then because of that, it just directly goes for the purple cup and then lets you pick up the orange cup because it knows you're building the efficient tower because, because you're, you're going to be suboptimal. And then they build the tower more efficiently together. And again, here, seeing it in action. Okay. All right. So, so just to summarize, the key idea here is it turns out that people tend to take suboptimal actions. They're actually like more likely to take suboptimal actions when we are in the near like end of the risk spectrum set settings. And what you're proposing here is we actually should go beyond our usual reward modeling and we should be able to capture the fact that people take these risky, risky type of behaviors and robots should be aware of that and plan based on that. And then here specifically, we have used ideas from prospect theory and, and uh, bounded uh, and prospect theory bound rationality and behavioral economics to capture this. Uh, but there could be other ways of capturing this risk of rare behavior. And this work, we actually presented this two weeks ago virtually at HRI. Um, this is work uh, that was led, this section was work that was led by my grad students, Erdem and Minet. All right. So that kind of summarizes the idea of building models of humans, being efficient about building our reward functions, and also thinking about the end of the risk spectrums and, and going beyond uh, what we have so far. So in the time that's remaining, what I'd like to do is I'd like to switch gears a little bit and, and discuss this setting where, where we are thinking about low dimensional representations instead of building like these fully like developed models of humans. So let me kind of think about that. Let's step back and think about that in, in, an, in an interactive collaborative setting. So imagine, or competitive, collaborative competitive setting. So imagine you have two humans and the two humans, they want to do a task, an interactive task together. Or maybe they want to play chess. Okay? So normally, like the way to model that is you would say, well, this person is going to have a model of its partner or, or opponent in this case, and, and basically try to think what would the opponents do, and based on that, take actions. That, that is called theory of mind. So that would be a first order theory of mind. If you even go one layer further in and say, well, this person is going to think about the partner, thinking about the person is making a decision and, 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 and going like multiple layers down, then you're going to get a second order theory of mind. And in general, like, you can go multiple layers down this tree and get an order theory of mind and even like solve for maybe the Nash equilibrium of what would happen if you think all the way down this tree. So that's commonly used, that, that model is actually commonly used in the field of human-robot interaction. Now, maybe not all the way down because that's not gonna be very efficient. Like as we can see, this model is going to become com completely like computationally infeasible very quickly. But, but the model in general has been like fairly used like in human-robot interaction and in general understanding interactions, right? So in multi-agent interactions, multi-agent reinforcement learning. And, and what people do is they basically say, hey, the human is going to have a model of the robot and similarly, the robot is going to have a model of the human. And actually, the first part of the talk, we were basically building this block. So everything we said was about the robot building a model of the human. Okay? We actually did this, this collaborative thing, in a different domain. We looked at it in a driving domain. This was joint work that I did at, at Berkeley with, with Sanjit and Shankar and, and Anka. And what we were looking at was, what if we have an autonomous car interacting with a human-driven car? How do we think about interaction in this game-theoretic fashion? And, and we actually like solve like this game theoretic problem using Stackelberg games, so, so making an approximation. But the idea was, hey, I have a robot car. The robot car should think about how it can influence humans. And the question is, well, what would the human do? And we did all this like human modeling again, where we used reward functions, let's say using learning from demonstrations and, and learning from preferences to learn this reward function, and then think about this two-player game interaction between the agents. 
and, and we ended up seeing like actually very interesting behavior. Even though like we solved this using approximations, we ended up seeing very interesting behavior. For example, when a car tries to change lanes, it starts nudging in in front of other cars and actually influence them to slow down to make to change lanes, which is something that autonomous cars still have a difficult time doing because they're not thinking about interactions a little bit more carefully. But our car was more assertive, more interactive because it did consider this game theoretic interaction. So that's really cool. But what I'd like to argue is not all tasks are like chess. Like you can consider a lot of interactive tasks that has nothing to do with this like playing chess and building computational models of each other. For example, like if you think about a construction task, if you think about two people trying to build it and make a building together, like if you have Bob and Alex collaborating with each other here, like Bob is not thinking, I wonder what Alex's estimate of my belief of the world is, right? Like that's like super high dimensional. One thing we know about humans is that they're bounded rational, like they don't have like that much space and resources to keep track of like so many like high dimensional beliefs. So what they're doing is they're actually like keeping track of very low dimensional cues like that, that allows them to, to collaborate on the task. They're keeping track of things like intent or like role or like much lower dimensional thing that represents the shared collaboration of the task. So, so I'm gonna actually represent this shared representation using the, this figure because I don't know what it is. So that's what the figure means. And then I'm gonna call this shared representation a convention. So, so this, is, this is a low dimensional shared representation that two, two agents are trying to build together and that's sufficient. It kind of like acts as a sufficient statistic that's sufficient for us to collaborate on the task and it is much more manageable than theory of mind. Okay? Again, we see the same thing when we are looking at two people trying to move a couch together. Like even if they don't use language or gaze or any of that, they're still able to do it because based on the forces, they keep track of who's leading and who's following and that's sufficient in order to do the task, okay? So the way I'm defining convention is that conventions are low dimensional shared representations that capture the interaction that exists between the agents and they can actually change over time. So, so that is my definition of conventions. So then if that is a definition of convention, I think like there are a lot of interesting questions that, that depend on the context and, and the particular interaction we are looking at. In a particular interaction, I think it's interesting to ask, well, what are some of these conventions that are emerging? Can the robots directly learn these conventions? And then can the robots influence the conventions? Can they change the conventions? So I'm gonna briefly just talk about a setup that we have been looking at and, and like what are the conventions in that setup? That setup is an assistive teleoperation setup where the human is putting in a controller into a joystick, but the robot needs to make sense out of those, those inputs. So the convention is again between the human and robot. So I'd like to try to answer some of these questions in that domain, but in general, this is a direction that we're very interested in and we have been looking at it from a variety of domains and types of interactions. But I think I'll have time to just briefly talk about the teleoperation domain. All right, so let's talk about assistive teleoperation. So assistive teleoperation, it's, it's actually a very difficult problem. It's an important problem. So uh, more than 1 million Americans actually use like these wheelchair, uh, wheelchairs that have an arm mounted on top of it. And they use the arm for various sorts of tasks like bathing or dressing themselves or, or feeding themselves. And it's actually pretty difficult to use these arms. So here's actually a video of a person using a JCO arm trying to open a fridge and get food out of it. And the thing I want you guys to notice is his hand. So look at his hand. So he keeps pushing the side. So what he's doing by pushing the side is actually pretty interesting. He's trying to switch modes between like what he's controlling at the end effector. He can either control X, Y, Z of the end effector. So that's one mode. Or he can control like the angles, yaw pitch roll, uh, yaw pitch roll of, the, of, of the end effector, and that's another mode. And this mode switching is actually the thing that, that takes like a lot of time and like understanding of how the system works in order to do like some of these simplest tasks that one needs to do here. So if you think about it, assistive robots, they're dexterous, and this dexterity makes it like really hard for the user to control the robot. So an idea that we have been thinking about is, could we make this more intuitive? So if you think about going from any point in the space to any other point in the space, you do need all those degrees of freedom. There's a reason they exist, right? Like you need all those six degrees of freedom. But conditioned on the task, you might not need all of them. So for example, imagine you have an arm that's moving on a sine wave. 
So if your arm is moving on a sine wave, and you already know it is moving on a sine wave, then you don't need six degrees of freedom to get the arm move on a sine wave, right? You only need like one degree of freedom. One degree of freedom is actually enough to do that. You can, you can do plus one and get the robot go to the right and minus one should get the robot go to the left. Like, like that is enough. So, so the idea that we've been exploring is conditioned on the type of task, like if you're looking at a feeding task or if you're looking at a cooking task, conditioned on the task, we should be able to learn low dimensional representations that make controlling these robots much more intuitive. And that's, that's what we decided to do. So what we do is offline, we collect some expert demonstrations from an expert or a caregiver uh, who's providing these high dimensional motions, general motions in the workspace. So sweeping motions or moving from one shelf to another shelf. And then what we were doing is at the end of the day, we wanna learn this low dimensional latent representation, a convention, so, so that we can, we can use a two degree freedom and make it much more intuitive for the person to use the robot. Okay. So the idea we're using here is, is using ideas from dimensionality reduction. So, so specifically, we're training a conditional variational autoencoder. We're training an encoder, a neural network encoder, and a neural network decoder uh, based on the data that we're collecting from our experts. So we get the state and actions from the experts, and what we are doing the dimensionality reduction on is on the action. So most of the prior work does dimensionality reduction on the state, but the thing that we're actually doing the dimensionality reduction on is on the control, on the action. So, so the control is going to become a low dimensional control Z, so then the per, that is the thing that's going to become more intuitive for the person to use. And again, conditioned on the state, then we can, we can train a decoder that tries to reconstruct the task. Right? So, so normally, if I have a CVAE, I have a loss that's about reconstruction, and, and then I get an encoder and decoder at the end of the day. We need to have a few more properties in order to make this work, so, so like beyond like what we have so far. So those properties include things like conditioning on the state, so that's, that's what I've already mentioned. The second property is actually reachability. So, so what basically this says, this is not controllability in the sense of controllability in linear systems, it's actually reachability. And what this basically says is that if you have a state S and state S prime in your workspace, there should exist a low level like controller Z that gets you from that state S to that state S prime. So, so that's all it's saying. The next property that we have is more of a continuity type of property. We're calling it temporal consistency too. So what this means is if, I, if I'm in a particular state and a particular action ended up taking me to the right, in the next state where I'm still very close to the first state, that same action should still get me to the right. So temporally, I gotta be consistent. And then finally, we have a property about scalability, which basically says if I put in more control, I would expect, like if I push like Z harder, I would expect in terms of the state uh, space, like my robot ends up moving, moving more too. So the reason I'm defining these properties is you can actually use these properties and then train your ver uh, conditional variational autoencoders ba autoencoder based on these properties that, that kind of represent the loss function and then learn your latent action. Then once you have it, then you can bring in your person, you have this low dimensional representation that's temporally consistent and can go from anywhere to anywhere and make sense to the person. So once you have it, then the person can just put in a control in this low degree freedom space, in this intuitive space, and then get a high, high dimensional controller. So, so once, once we train the autoencoder, we just take the decoder, and then based on that, we can control. So let me actually show you how that works in practice. So, so we did a user study where we collect seven minutes of kinesthetic demonstrations from an expert. And what I'm comparing is end effector control, which is like what you saw already in the first video. So you either have a linear mode, X, Y, Z, or you have an angular mode, you have each role. And we are comparing that with what we are calling latent actions, where we have this convention that's built, low dimensional convention, where we have Z1 and Z2, like two degrees of freedom for controlling the robot. So the task I'm showing here is a long horizon task where we are looking at making an apple pie. So you have different segments of the task. And again, on the left, you have end effector control. The user is having such a hard time like understanding what the robot means and is doing. But on the right, again, it's much smoother and it's even like lower degree of freedom too but it's much smoother and the person is easily just moving things around and, and is like much faster in doing the task. At the end, we asked the user to steer. So everyone did their own version of steering, which is kind of weird, but yeah. 
yeah, so, so that was very promising because, yeah, we are losing, using these latent representations in order to better, like, provide this more intuitive way of controlling and the trajectories actually look much smoother and nicer. So, so the summary so far is we are basically embedding these personalized behaviors into latent spaces and then we're formalizing these properties that need to be satisfied in order to learn like a conditional variational autoencoder do dimensionality reduction uh, to learn these conventions. And then that allows us to, to control a robot with efficient amount of data. So this is a work that Dylan Lucy, my postdoc did, um, and then this is going to be presented at uh, ICRA. Uh, this year. So, so Dylan is actually joining Virginia Tech next year. So that is exciting. Um, yeah, so, so, so we, we were very excited about this work. And, and one future direction that we're currently working on that I just want to like very briefly mention is the fact that these latent actions, they are, they're very intuitive and they provide this low dimensional control. But the issue around using them is that we still have challenges for doing precise manipulation. So, so let me show you how this works in practice. So, so here, Hung is using our robot, is using our approach. And what he wants to do is he wants to go and pick up a marshmallow. So he's pointing at the marshmallow he wants to go pick up. He's like going over it. He's using our controller, so it's smooth, it's nice. He doesn't need to think about that. He like looks at if it is actually like on top of the marshmallow and then goes down and boom, like he's not able to like pick up the marshmallow. So if you consider some of these precise manipulation tasks that become actually very important when you're looking at tasks like feeding, like you're not able to like handle that. Latent actions is not able to handle that. So if you're looking at cutting or scooping, all of these are necessary when you're thinking about assistive feeding. So that's an area that we're all like very excited about and we're working on assistive feeding as like the main application because you see it not working. So, so I think it, it's, it's an exciting area to deal with. And currently the one idea that we have been exploring is how to use shared autonomy and shared control where the robot like also like builds a belief of what, what you really want. And based on that belief, it can help you control the robot like much more accurately or even control your preferences of how to pick up the object much more accurately. Okay. All right, so that kind of summarizes the works that I wanted to like mainly cover, right? So, so we want to think about building models of humans using being data efficient, think about risk, but also think about settings where we don't need like a fully like high dimensional model of belief of agents when we think about specifically when we think about interactions and conventions is enough for that. And, and I hope I've kind of convinced you guys like of the two main points I wanted to get across. So there is really an opportunity here using ideas from learning, using ideas from control when we think about human CPS. And, and I've, I've been talking about different ways of building computational models of humans and thinking about, thinking about low dimensional statistics. But the thing I want to kind of wrap up with and, and briefly mention is this idea that we spend all this time learning reward functions. We spend all this time learning conventions. And once you have that, you just, you're happy with it, you go with it. But the thing is humans change, right? Like humans are not going to stick to the same convention forever or stick to the same reward function forever. You already see this in assistive teleoperation. Like, like after like a few iterations, like humans get used to it and then they behave like differently. And, and then we should consider those in, 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 in this specific like robotic setting, for example, or like another setting that this comes up is using exoskeletons, right? Like when you have exoskeletons, like one of the biggest problems is over assistance, right? Robot is trying to build a model of the person and in, in the rehab setting, let's say, and it tries to help the person learn how to walk again. But if it is, if it is, it doesn't capture the fact that humans change, then it doesn't capture things like fatigue or the person that, the, the fact that the person has learned like how the robot is doing things and is just like getting used to that. So, so we should consider adaptations and the fact that humans change in a variety of these settings. And it's actually pretty challenging to do it, but I do think it's extremely important. And, and, and that is in robotics, but also beyond robotics, I think this shows up all the time. So, so another setting that this, show, this shows up is in driving. So, so I used to live in San Francisco. And in San Francisco, there are these vehicles, uh, autonomous cars that are testing. And it's interesting because they, they tend to get stuck at intersections. And when I went around these cars, like now I just like go around them because I think they're probably stuck. Um, and that's a little bit like, like when I think about it, I'm like, that's crazy because I'm giving wrong data to, to cruise, uh, which like scares me that I'm giving wrong data to it. And then in addition to that, like it's like very interesting that based on the three interactions that I've had with an autonomous car, my behavior has already changed. I've like adapted. 
So, so here is like a very short term interaction setting where my behavior has adapted. And we should think about that adaptation of the humans. And we should think about how robots can, can actually like respond to that. And similarly, like we see the same sort of behavior, then we have much more long term interaction. So if you look at just driving behavior, driving behavior in Palo Alto is very different from driving behavior in Tehran, which is, which is where I grew up. So both of them kind of work okay. So like, like they, they, they work fine, uh, but, but it's a very different equilibrium. Like, right, like the, the actions you take has totally different meanings when, when you are in, in Tehran versus where you are in Palo Alto. So, uh, and the reason that that, ha that has happened is through repeated, long-term repeated interactions, people ended up in very different cultures and, and conventions, driving cultures and conventions uh, that is due to repeated long-term interactions. So I think what is interesting is, is to think about how these behaviors actually change over time, what equilibria do they converge to? And, and in addition to that, could we think about putting autonomy robots uh, to influence humans in a way to get to a better equilibrium as opposed to a worse equilibrium or like to different, to get to better, better socially optimal behavior. And that's something that we are looking at actually in our traffic work where we are looking at mixed autonomy traffic where we have autonomous cars and human driven cars and then thinking about different equilibria that emerge and how we can use autonomous cars to halt the things. So, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank the group and thank you guys for listening, and I can take any questions. All right. Thank you for the wonderful talk. The, uh, the virtual talks are always hard because there's no <laughs> gotcha. notable applause, but uh, I'll do it on behalf of everyone else who you can't hear right now. Um, it, it's fantastic to see these challenges put in the forefront. Uh, so, there's a lot of people online, which is fantastic. Um, perhaps minute, uh, there's a couple minutes for some questions. Uh, if somebody would like to maybe raise their hand or jump in the chat window and say they have a question or just be brave and unmute your, your mic, we'll try this out and see how it works. We're in new, new world here. <laughs> So let me let me do this. I want to ask a question while, and then we'll let everyone get brave and and we'll figure out the technology front. Um, so so you're, I mean, I think the preference based learning stuff you're doing is awesome. Um, you know, we've been playing with that a little, and and uh, uh, along with looking at this notion of conventions, which I think is is super cool as well. And in some ways, there's obviously connection points between all of these things. Um, you you kind of had buried in there. Uh, the role of dynamics and consistency and constraints. And I know a lot of that stuff lives below the surface and you just don't have time to touch on all those things. But I'm wondering what you think the most sort of relevant dynamics questions are in this context. Um, because you have the feasibility conditions that you had in your, in your preference-based learning kind of ideas. Um, you have dimensionality reduction, which you might be able to get with models, along with uh, then projected the, the learning through encoders and things. So, so where do you think the critical questions lie uh, from a dynamics perspective and how dynamics in, could inform the, mm -hmm. the learning process? Yeah, so I do think a lot of, so, so for example, like when we were building these auto encoders, right? Like we're doing dimensionality reduction, but there are a lot of interesting, like, like we can just like throw data at it, right? And then do this dimensionality reduction using like an auto encoder and learn something. But like in order to give meaning to that like low dimensional representation, in order to, for that low dimensional representation to satisfy interesting properties, I do think there are a lot of interesting ideas from control and dynamics that could be used there. So in another work where we are trying to learn this convention, this low dimensional representation, we need to encode things like linearity on top of this low dimensional representation. We need to encode things like, like that, that linear dynamical system needs to be controllable for things to work out okay. So I think there are a lot of interesting like intersections here because, because ideas from dynamics and control can provide like a framework, a structure, and then learning can, can, can address some of these like scalability issues that, that we've had for, for a long time. Same thing is true actually like on the convention side of things, right? There's a, there a lot of work on multi-agent control and, and, and multi-agent planning. And, and a lot of things like very quickly becomes uh, intractable because, because things like blow up. Uh, but, but the idea of learning conventions is like humans are able to do this. Like the fact that humans are able to do this, that, that gives me hope. That, gives, that tells me that, okay, like, like maybe 
we could use a set of tools like combining learning and control in order to in order to learn these conventions because prior work in control like wouldn't really scale like when it comes to learning these low dimensional uh, representations and using that in a multi agent type type of setting. Um, so I think dimensionality reduction is interesting. I think the yeah, ideas from interaction, like I think it would be really interesting multi agent uh, control, multi agent planning would be like interesting ideas to use. Yeah, in this uh, lots of really uh, deep questions. Uh, so I, Ian Mitchell raised his hand. So we're going to take a question uh, from him next, if I can. Uh, Ian, why don't you go ahead? If you want to unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, Dorsa. Thank you very much for the talk this morning. Hi, Ian. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that you uh, did some experiments where you had multiple humans providing the learning input. And then at the end, you talked a bit about the fact that different cultures have developed in driving scenarios. And I'm wondering, do you see different behaviors coming from different humans and and you know this is all fine if that behavior curve sort of looks like a normal distribution mm -hmm. but it could be really bad if that behavior curve looks bimodal or trimodal or something like that and the robot somehow or other ends up learning something in the middle that no humans actually use yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Yes, yeah. So yeah, so we do user studies, right? And then we have like different users and we try to like capture the fact that like this differences between humans. In some settings, we do see some differences. For example, um, the teleoperation setting. Like one interesting we, thing we saw was different users have different preferences about how much, how predictable the robot was. For example, like, like we did this comparison between latent actions and end effector control. And some people, even though they had like a harder time using end effector control and you could like see like the robot is not doing the right thing, it was taking forever. At the end of the day, they were like, I actually like preferred that because I knew what it was doing. And then the latent actions, like, like it was like working nicely, but it was like a little bit like magically working nicely. And people were like, I cannot predict like why this is doing the thing it is doing. And I actually like do not prefer that. So, so there are these types of differences, which is like pretty interesting and actually informs like how we are building uh, these types of robots, which, which I think is pretty, um, yeah, pretty intriguing. Um, yeah, but then the specific thing, you yeah, know, in driving, we see like differences between preferences and we try to like separate them. In some of these uh, teleoperation settings, like it was pretty similar. One other thing that we saw differences is um, the switches, like, like the, the specific bases that the lower dimension is aligned with, there are different preferences on that. So we actually like personalize that. So you might want to like have a different meaning for going to the front or left. Like, like you, you learn the low dimension, but different people have different preferences around which directions, like which bases that should correspond to. So we personalize that actually to specific users. Okay, thank you. Great. Nice, great. Uh, well, with that, I'm going to actually close uh, this session because we have five minutes till the next one. I don't want to give everyone a chance to maybe uh, uh, attend to biological needs or whatnot before the first talk of the next session. So with that, uh, one more time, let's thank Dorsa very much for, for giving a fantastic and wonderful talk. It's, uh, it's really great seeing this, these future directions on this intersection in an incredibly challenging domain. So thanks for giving us this wonderful overview. Uh, so with that, thank you everyone for attending. We'll start our next session in five minutes. Uh, so thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing screen. Yeah.